Hello, and welcome to episode 564 of the official StopStopRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. Today, I'm joined by our best ball bros for part two of our best ball series. It is Mania One champ, Justin Herzig, Michael Leone, author of the best ball manifesto. Herzig, how's it going? Doing well, doing well. Leone, good morning, afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Today's show is part two of a six-part series. In this series, we have already covered what to think about when you're on the clock. I think that's the most important one. We're going to talk about some concepts we talked about on there, and we're going to gloss over them here because we assume that you listened to part one, so please make sure you listen to part one. Part two, three, four, and five, we're going to cover the strategy for each of the four biggest best ball sites. They all are slightly different based on payouts, based on structure, based on scoring systems, based on rosters. So we need to go over the quirks for all of those. We will end this series with some advanced and counterintuitive strategies. Reminder that if you're looking for micro player takes, our player takes, those flow through to the rankings that are part of DraftKit Pro. In that DraftKit Pro, we have continuously updating rankings for every best ball format. You can upload our rankings to format to r- platforms where that's allowed. We also have a ton of context around those rankings for all the best ball grinders out there. Underdog. Underdog to me, and I know you've said this, Leone, it's like its own world. Like what's going on on Underdog is not going on on any many or any other sites. It is absolutely wild. The people, in my opinion, have absolutely jumped the shark going nuts on wide receiver, have absolutely jumped the shark on rookies. The problem is I haven't found a great crowner strategy to that, and so maybe they hasn't jumped the shark. Before we get into all that, though, I want to start with the structure, and we're going to focus on the flagship tournament here, Best Ball Mania 4. $25 buy-in, 677 thousand entries you play in a 12 group 12 team group top to advance you play in a 15 person uh, uh week 15 you play in a 16 person group the winner advances week 16 16 person group winner advances week 17 441 person final the payouts are very top heavy three million to first one million to second only 300k to third 10th place out of that 441 person final only gets 30k one percent of first in other words, this is massively, massively top heavy. The quirk here is that this year, Underdog added big regular season prizes. Best team in week one through 14, just cumulative score, 500K to first, 200K to second, 150K to third, and also the top 10,000 regular season teams get 250K, 10X their money. I want to start there, Justin, on Underdog. Should people be thinking about regular season, winning the regular season when they're drafting their best ball mania teams? And if so, how would you change your strategy while you're drafting for trying to get that regular season prize? Yeah. I mean, a third of the prize pool is a lot of money. It's very important. And uh, even like if you're not getting the very top all the way, you know, if you just finish in the top one and a half percent of lineups, you're 10 X in yours and what one and a half percent, that's like one out of 75. So like, yeah, it's not actually uh, proportional to what the chance of it happening is, but 10 X is still pretty solid. And uh, so I would say like, yes, I still, I want to make sure that my strategy does account for that a third of the prize pool is in that regular season. The challenge is, what am I doing uniquely to kind of change my strategy? The answer, though, is really not that much because so much of our, hey, total EV and our chance of getting to week 17 and making money there is based off our advance rate and how we do in the regular season. And the data that we're always looking at, the strategy that we have is based off finishing in the kind of maybe top 10 percent of those regular season lineups is what we're really kind of targeting towards. How do we adjust from top 10 percent to top 1 percent? Maybe there are some things that you can do that, like maybe this lineup, I'm going to not draft rookies. I'm going to not draft the Jamison Williams, the Kyler Murrays, the guys who uh, maybe are going to take more time to actually playing. And I'm really going to focus on just trying to get a 1% outcome. Um, But I think like, hey, that's fine for a couple lineups. But I think across the entire board, really, our strategy isn't vastly changing. We're really trying to still draft those strong regular season teams. And I'm not willing to give up my playoff strategy, which is where those rookies come in, which is where those discounts on a Kyler and Jamison comes in, which is where week 17 correlation comes in. I'm not willing to ignore that stuff just to try to get those top prizes in the regular season. Yeah, I mean, there's some clear micro takes you can have. If I'm going for the regular season, like uh, Herzig mentioned, some of them, I'd throw Brees Hall into that mix. I'd throw Javante Williams into that mix. Some other guys that are coming off of 
injury, Leone, do you think people should be adjusting their drafting strategy for the regular season prizes on underdog? Like Justin said, at the end of the day, you're, you're kind of trying to advance as many well set up playoff teams as possible. And those aren't as combative as it sometimes it gets made out to be. I do think like as a draft develops, there might be some spots where, you know, if your league's going crazy on stacking and, you know, not giving you your stack partners, but you're getting a ton of ADP value, maybe you lean into that a little bit more towards the end of the draft and worry a little bit less about, you know, week 17 bringbacks. And you just worry a bit more about just building this monster ADP value team that maybe could win the regular season and vice versa. This is like a super sharp league. They're following ADP super closely. Maybe you're better off just kind of leaning into having like really well correlated setup teams come for the playoffs. So I'm being flexible. I don't think that will happen that often where there's this super obvious direction, but it might happen here and there if you're drafting a lot of teams. As far as structurally, some things that I see different, I think two QB teams are probably better suited for if you're trying to win the regular season, whereas three QB teams, I think there's some advantages to the playoffs with you know having to win one out of 16, one out of 16, and then a finals where you can get some unique stacks through mm-hmm. and whatnot. So I've had some teams where now I've tacked on a third quarterback to get that playoff correlation, to get that third stack that if I was purely playing for the regular season, it's something I might not do. Uh, okay. I want to circle back on the actual playoff structure for underdog. I want to focus on the scoring system here for a second, because to me that is so lost in what's going on on underdog is the scoring system. This is half PPR, no bonuses. This is effectively FanDuel scoring for any of you that play DFS on FanDuel. All that matters is touchdowns. I mean, that is an overwhelming majority of your team's points comes from touchdowns. They're low scoring games. Touchdowns have so much to do with it. Yet, yet on underdog, people go nuts at the wide receiver position. And I I can't really argue it because I don't have a great counter to it. Number one, obviously the counter would be to take more running backs, but I don't have a great counter to it based on ADPs right now. And and second of all, I think wide receivers are better for best ball uh in general now a lot of like the hero rb and zero rb stuff i think it's applicable for best ball maybe it looks works a little bit better when you can grind waivers and stuff like that in a redraft league but i don't know leone like i I just it it struck me for half ppr the wide receiver adps are completely out of control how do you think people are adjusting to the scoring system on their dog and what can we do yeah, I, mean, I think it's hard because, as you said, the, the, you got to come up with a counter. Like whether you think it's right, wrong, at the end of the day, all that matters is that you're drafting the best teams possible in the environment that you're in. And you know, the truth is that wide receiver, because you start three, and because there are some advantages to wide receiver over running back in general, even with the half PPR scoring system, you can only get so running back heavy. You know, we talked about it in, in the last pod. Like you can take running backs early, you can take a lot of them. You can't really do both. So you have to pick and choose and be careful. Where I see specifically an advantage right now is maybe like rounds two and three, where some of these receivers are getting pushed up that maybe shouldn't quite be there. Where I'll probably take Nick Chubb over Chris Olave, for example. You know, and our rankings reflect that. So I think you can start with wide receiver in round one. There's going to be exceptions, of course, but maybe round two. But getting a running back in round two or three in the current environment makes a lot of sense to me. I think you're getting some running backs that typically would be drafted at the one-two turn. You're getting them at more like the two-three turn this year. Yeah. And and one thing I would say uh, about this, Herzig, about the scoring system, is that quarterbacks are going very high on underdog. But I think that's right because quarterbacks on underdog are worth so much. I mean, they're scoring so consistently, so predictably, and they're a big part of your final score. On DraftKings, that's not as much the case. And we'll get to DraftKings in the next episode, but I am so, so, so outrageously wide receiver heavy on DraftKings and not worrying about quarterback as much. So whereas based on scoring system, I think wide receivers go too high on underdog. I think quarterbacks actually might be going right, which pains me to say as a mid slash late round truther for the last like, 20 years any more thoughts on scoring system in the fallout on underdog justin yeah i I completely agree and i think that's why those three elite qbs have really pushed into that second round right now but what's interesting is after that tier um especially when you start going down to like the justin herbert uh, you know places we haven't really seen him push up as much as other than three so maybe you might be able to find some guys that are being you know ranked traditionally as they would have had the past couple years Um, And now there's a larger gap between those elite ones. I think it is an interesting one of how do we kind of combat this? Because, yes, you can just say, hey, it's important. I'm going to draft my wide receivers early because if I don't, I'm going to miss out. Um, But 
how do you combat it? I don't think, as Leone said, like, hey, you need to go, let me go heavy on running backs to combat it because you do really get left out. Maybe it actually is, okay, these are going to go early. Let me go wide receiver, wide receiver to start the draft. Starting off with two elite wide receivers, then when other people are trying to still catch up in those fifth, sixth, seventh round that people are going wide receiver heavy, maybe you're able to find some value on running backs that traditionally were in that third round, fourth round, but are now going kind of the sixth round, the seventh round. We love the guys like Damian Pierce. There's substantial upside in someone like a Cam Akers. So maybe your way to combat is say, I'm not going to ignore wide receiver, but I'm going to grab two elite ones to really start the draft. And then instead of continuing to chase these others, maybe I then try to find the high upside guys like those running backs, like the tight ends, maybe the QBs. One other quirk on underdog I wanted to talk about was that it's an 18 round draft rather than a 20 round draft. A lot of sites we're going to talk about are 20 round drafts. Underdog is 18. You start eight, you have 10 on your bench. I personally prefer longer drafts because I think one of my edges is finding guys in rounds 18, 19, 20 that are actually viable, whereas a lot of people are just like randomly clicking buttons. Back there, Herzig, any takes on how 18 round draft is different than 20? Yeah, I think when you're drafting with 20, everyone leaves the draft room creating, feeling pretty good about every position because even your bad positions, you were like, yeah, but I got three of them and something's going to work out. It's okay. With underdog, you kind of are forced to really feel a little uncomfortable in at least one of your roster positions. And for me personally, I think my best teams are the ones where I feel very uncomfortable with one position, maybe even two. The teams I like the least are the ones where I'm going balanced across and just trying to make sure I'm getting guys in all of them. So one thing I would say is like, hey, feel free to lean into uncertainty. And maybe it's, you know, maybe it is you're going with a Taysom Hill or maybe you're going with that tight end that you think is going to have the breakout. And that's okay if you don't love your tight ends at the end of the day because you didn't waste you know, strong draft capital on them. You're making a bet that something in that offense, maybe it correlates with your QB, really pays off. And now because it's only 18, I'm going to focus on being really strong at a couple other positions and not say, oh, I need that third tight end. And instead, no, I want to go with the higher upside guy, maybe like a, a correlated wide receiver or something. Leone, I want to shift gears slightly here. The other spot where I think underdog people may have broken their brains is the rookie ADPs. People are going massively out of their way to lean into rookies on underdog. We're like behind ADP on most rookies based on projection right now. I think a part of that is people are understanding that rookies tend to break out late in the year which is where all the money is, and you get a bit of a discount them right now due to week one projectable work. I agree with that strategy, but maybe it's gone too far. Is there any counter, Leonier, where maybe you think it's right where the rookies are going right now on underdog? Yeah, it seems like recently they've maybe dialed back a little bit. You know, we had a couple weeks span where they were super high. We're still behind ADP on most of the rookies. And I kind of think of it as a portfolio. You know, I'm trying to get one of these guys at a decent price tag in most of my drafts because I do understand the late season value that they have and they're just hard to quantify. And when there are players that are hard to quantify, I'll lean into the ADP a little bit more as long as I don't think it's egregiously wrong. Ultimately, you know, I'd rather draft rookies on other sites right now. Um, But you still can usually find, you know, when Jackson Smith and Jigba falls past ADP, I might be quick to grab him just knowing that I'm not going to get a lot of them. And I understand the bat is the type of player I like. I don't agree with the market that on the context of this year that he should be valued as highly as he does, but I want some exposure. And the flip side is if you're taking three, four rookies on your team at these really aggressive price tags, it's going to be tough. Like some of them are going to flop completely. And even the ones that don't might not give you value until too late in the year. And you may have fallen behind the eight ball in terms of even being able to advance out of your regular season group. Last thing that I want to talk about with underdog is their exact playoff structure. So advance two out of your 12 team league to start. Fine. It gets really daunting after that, man. Just like looking at it, like makes me queasy. I have to win a 16 person group in week 15. I have to win a 16 person group in week 16. And then in week 17, it's a 441 person group. And if I get 10th place, I only get 30 K. I mean, I get it first. I got to get first for 3 million. I mean, I'm like, I, I, <laughs> Call me crazy. That's going to be really freaking hard. So what do you think about, Justin, what do you think about how to base our teams or how we should be thinking about our teams for this incredibly hard journey we're going to be on to advance in week 15, 16, and then somehow beat a 441-person field where, just like last year, there's going to be a ton of Justin, whoever the breakout player is, Josh Jacobs, 
uh, Justin Jefferson, Travis, whatever, Travis Kelsey, wh- whatever it is, that guy's going to be massively owned. And one of the things that's frustrating to me about this, and I actually mentioned this to Karain, and I think he may have been insulted when he did the show after he won. I was like, the goal is effectively to get to week 17 with the worst team possible. He had Mike Evans at like 2%. That's the stone cold nuts. I want to get to week 17 with the worst team possible. I don't know how to actually do that though. I mean, you can't set out to do that, right? So anyways, Justin, how do you think about all this craziness that happens at the end? Yeah, I mean, you definitely can't set out to do it um, with your entire lineup. You can maybe pick some pieces like you talked about with the rookies or maybe someone who's going to have a lower advance rate because they miss out. There's some kind of micro takes here and there. Uh, But yeah, the overall larger point is if you draft 150 teams, you have around a little more than a 9% chance on average you get at least one team through the finals, just to the finals. That's extremely difficult. But we want to put ourselves in the best position possible. The same things we were doing to advance out of our initial pool, uh, that advance rate aspect, the stacking, everything we talked about in the previous pod, those still apply for weeks 15, week 16. I think what is very important is that we don't completely change our structure to start focusing specifically on 15 or 16 with a game stacking, with correlation, in lieu of, hey, the week 17, which is where the money really matters. The one way that I'm taking the playoffs as a whole is I am starting to think about, okay, playoff schedule, whether it's the weather aspects, whether it's the opponents, whether it's what, cha- what which games teams have the best chance of having multiple shootouts, which teams have the best chance of, um, you know, whether it's home games, whatever, like those are the things that I can control. I do have confidence in like, hey, who they're playing. We have an idea of what those games can look like. I'm not focused as much on defensive matchups, but more so on when you have two powerful offenses that can potentially turn into shootouts. So I would say I'm paying attention to kind of the playoffs as a whole, but then of course, putting my more focus on the week 17. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, and I want you to hear your response to that, Leone. But I did want to point out, like, if you're looking at playoff schedules, for example, the Titans play the Texans twice and the Seahawks in week 15, 16, 17, right? I mean, I don't, I, I think Texans defense could be better. I don't have a great take on Seahawks defense, but I don't think either of them are going to be good. So, like, I think that's going to be a good playoff schedule regardless. Leone, do you think we should be thinking about that? And how do you think about these final three weeks on underdog specifically? Yeah, I think we should think about it a little bit. I mean, there are teams that we just know are going to be bad. Again, I want to get into specifically like good defense, bad defense. In general, if a team like the Texans is bad, you're, you're going to put up fantasy points against them, and they're probably going to be one of the worst teams in the league. And the weather stuff, I think, you know, it's a tiebreaker. You know, we saw last year there were four or five games one of those playoff weeks where it was a, it was a disaster. You know, the weather was so cold, and that doesn't happen every year. But, you know, it's worth noting that, like, that that could happen um so I, I think it's it's a good tiebreaker it's not something i've taken super into account the other things you can do you know in general if you advance just a ton of teams you have a better chance of just getting lucky in terms yeah. of uh, how many players you have that are healthy in terms of those unique combinations so being able to advance a ton of teams makes sense i think being aware of you know, we'll, we'll talk about what time of year to draft, but I want to do too many teams too early, even though they have a ton of upside and, and ADP value, just because your odds of getting through healthy players to the playoffs is less. And that has a really big impact on your expected value when you make the playoffs. There are other tournaments on underdog. There's all these puppies, which are $5 tournaments, which fill in like literally two days. There's, there's some of these uh, smaller window tournaments. There's higher stake stuff, bulldog. And stuff like that, you know, I, again, I think I would encourage people with all these other tournaments, think about where your edge is in smaller, higher stakes tournaments with smaller finals. You don't have to think about week 17 at all, right? And so, like, I like playing some of those high stakes uh, stuff where um, it's really small finals. You know, you only need to beat 12 people in the final. Last year in the, in the DK final, I had to beat uh, six peoples. And so, you know, finding stuff like that, that fits your specific skill set, I think makes sense. Justin, any other comments quickly on any strategy for these sidebar, I would call them underdog yeah. best ball. Yeah, I think rule number one, just read the rules because at those advanced rates, how many in the finals, those are very important. And like we talked about in the previous pod um, with regards to ADP is kind of shifting as a result of week 17. Well, these tournaments have the same ADP as mm-hmm. the BBM. So if you're not accounting for week 17 at all, which you probably shouldn't in these really small field ones, uh, especially like we're talking six, 12 people like that small, um, then maybe you can find some ADP values of players that, hey, should be being drafted on your team, but aren't because people don't like that week 17 matchup. Just some things to think about. 
for sure. All right. That is going to do it for this look at underdog best ball for the summer. We'll be back next episode to talk about DraftKings best ball and how to approach that. I think it's very, very different personally. Thank you for listening as best ball summer descends upon our souls. Don't forget we're here to help. DraftKid Pro covers all the rankings and contacts you need to get there on all sites. Be sure you're following us on Twitter, especially for more micro player takes. At two hats, one mic. At Justin Herzig. At Adam Levitan. At Establish the Run. For Leone, for Herzig, for Bruce Luke, good luck, everybody.